Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending November 15th. Another great contributors show. Thank you for all the contributors, and I will try to remember to mention you as I get to each article. Those are my favorite shows to do when I have a good input from the viewers. And this first one is from my friend Joe D. on Facebook, also known as Ivan, from Washington Post. U.S. approves first genetically modified potato for commercial planting. The Agricultural Department on Friday approved the first genetically modified potato for commercial planting in the United States, a move likely to draw the ire of groups opposed to artificial manipulation of foods. This potato was created by the J.R. Simplot Company. It's engineered to contain less of a suspected human carcinogen that occurs when a potential potato is fried and also less bruising during transport. Uh, I know the people that are just totally against all GMOs of any type are probably going to go totally freaky on this. Um, I can see in some cases genetic modification of some types of crops uh, are necessary. I mean, if you've seen what original wild corn looked like before it was made into genetically modified corn, it's it would not even probably feed half of the United States population, let alone the world. But um, I still do have concerns myself when they go into uh, genetic modification and it becomes a monocrop type of culture to where every plant is identical to every other plant. I mean, we've had that problem in the past with bananas too because bananas are basically clones of each other when you have some type of a blight or a disease stripe banana plants it basically goes through the whole crop lickety split because there just isn't enough variation to be able to fight off diseases and stuff like that so anyway we'll see how this works out um, APHIS said it has received hundreds of submissions from individuals or groups about Simplot's potato during a public comment period and um, yeah people opposed to genetic uh, crops in general obviously lent their comments and stuff like that. Um, we'll have to wait and see about that. I mean, it's got its good points and it's got its bad points, but I do think we need to uh, have some backup plans there too. And uh, uh, also the fact of uh, the, the, the other problem I have with genetically modified plants and stuff like that is when somebody has complete control for decades and decades of uh, the seed stock and things like that because if you plant the genetically modified corn you sign a contract where you don't even own the seeds the plant produces they're uh, owned by the company so you can't even replant your own seeds so um, a little bit more control than I feel comfortable with at least and next up this is from my friend Brenda R sent this in. This is from Gizmodo. This company is making robot security guards that look like Daleks. I'll put the picture up here. It, it looks vaguely similar to a Dalek, but um, just the idea of the fact that I think more and more we're going to get into one of the first types of jobs that's going to be probably replaced in, in large numbers, I think, is actually robot security guards. You will probably have where you would have maybe a large plant run by Ford or GM or something like that that would maybe during the evening have 20, a staff of 20 or 30 security guards. Uh, you may be down to just a skeleton crew of two or three security guards that each work a different shift and all of the rest would be just wandering robots that uh, have cameras and microphones and stuff like that and uh, only report in when anything out of, out of the unusual, you know, anything out of the ordinary, anything unusual happens, they would report back to the main security stations. So. I think this does bode for the robotic future of a lot of stuff. I know I've seen posts on Facebook and elsewhere about that uh, McDonald's more and more may be trying robot or ordering machines rather than going up to the counter and ordering your meal from McDonald's. You'll just go up to a, a little kiosk or something like that and place your order that way. And so uh, it may be rare to actually find somebody in McDonald's working behind a cash register sometime in the near or far off future, depending on when this takes place and when it happens. And this next one is from, uh, let me get it right here, this is from my friend Tim P, and this is from Engadget. U.S. Navy puts its first laser weapon into service. I guess they've been using it for quite a while, but they didn't release the information to the public, probably because of, you know, national security, secrecy, stuff like that, but... Um, from the article, it's official the U.S. Navy has entered the future. Vice Admiral John Miller tells Bloomberg that the USS Ponce, an amphibious transport, has been using the Navy's laser weapon system in the Persian Gulf since last August. The high-tech arsenal is no threat to larger vehicles, but is potentially ideal for defending against Iran's fleet of smaller ships. The Ponce can use non-lethal non laser flashes to spook enemies or thwart their sensors and can destroy small craft including airborne drones. Um, the picture, there, there's a little video here below, but actually the little video below 
uh, uses a lot of animated footage that I've shown before when I talked about developing of laser weapons, so some of it is not very new. Um, the other thing that concerns me, and they even talk about it um, in some other articles about this too, is the fact that if you're in really cloudy conditions, if the enemy is able to produce a huge amount of white smoke for cover, uh, if there's a dust storm or something like that, it may <coughs> make these weapons pretty much totally, if not you know, partially or, or completely ineffective to be able to use because basically it is just amplified light waves so anything that would bounce or scatter the light waves and uh, as far as even in the animation too when you're talking about knocking down drones I think it's only good for knocking down surveillance drones I don't know if it has the capability if you have some type of a, a really fast object coming in you know maybe at uh, supersonic speeds or something like that towards the ship um, with more powerful lasers obviously it could work in principle but with this laser I don't think it's going to be anything in protecting a ship you're still going to need those uh, electronic Gatling guns to blow uh, really fast craft attacking your ship to, to get that taken care of but hey you know it's first generation what do you expect I mean it's at least effective in some ways and like they said it can uh, blind sensors and stuff like that so it could be used as a defensive weapon just as much as an offensive weapon and this next one is from my friend Tom Duff, IFL Science. This is an older post, actually, but it, it has to do with what I'm going to talk to you next, and it's mostly going to be about the, the Rosetta Comet and the um, Philae lander that um, it did pretty much succeed, I will have to say. I'll talk about that in a minute, though. But this is graphic shows the size of Rosetta's comet, and I'll put this up here. It's showing what the comet looks like in relationship to downtown Los Angeles and as you can see if it were to just land even gently on top of downtown Los Angeles there would be no downtown Los Angeles it's only a couple of kilometers wide but if you look at it in a three-dimensional aspect which this shows and uh, I mean just imagine if this thing came crashing in at thousands and thousands of miles per hour I mean maybe the whole county of Los Angeles if not a big portion of California itself would just not exist anymore at the normal speeds if it were to hit something like that now, I'm not saying that the Rosetta Comet is in any danger of hitting us. As far as I know, it's it's not a comet that is even going to come close to, to that. But there is something out there that's going to eventually have our name on it. And so uh, let's get up to date as to what happened. Some of you with me watched the feed, the live streaming. Um, I was kind of, if you're a real science geek, it was, it was interesting, I'll have to say. But I was still disappointed as far as what they did towards the general public. It was basically just people looking at screens and then they clapped and cheered and hugged each other and then speech after speech after speech they showed no animation of what actually would be going on in real time and they had that some of that was even available they've even showed it in some of the press release stuff so at least in the corner of the video or uh, I would say in the main feed put the animation showing people and explaining on the way what's actually happening in real time and then off to the corner show the people standing around the monitor staring at them because that's just not that interesting to the general public so I would definitely just like I've talked about NASA in the past I would give the European Space Agency an F as far as public promotion or helping to get the public interested in the science but as far as the success of the mission now these are the things that happened right and these are the things that happened wrong it obviously after 10 years was very good that they were able to actually get the Rosetta spacecraft into the proper orbit around the comet that is even accomplishing that is quite a bit and then they also got the lander to deploy but the problem they had when the lander touched down was there was supposed to be some jet blasts to keep it from bouncing there was some some rocket blasts that were supposed to happen that didn't happen there was also supposed to be the harpoons firing to anchor it in place so that it could drill for samples more effectively that didn't happen either but however because of the way the legs were designed it still was able to make a safe touchdown and not damage itself which is good but if you're looking at the fact of gravity being so low on that comet itself this 180 something pound craft which was the weight of the lander only weighs the equivalent of about one ounce on there so the stability of as far as where it's landing and being able to stay there where it was supposed to land that didn't happen it actually bounced and they believe slid besides that so they think it took two different bounces and slid underneath a cliff and ended up being with the cliff overhanging ended up putting it in the dark so that they could not char charge the batteries using the solar panels now what they have done since, it, it lasted, uh, well first let me say it lasted two and a half days and did send back a lot of useful data and what they did after that was they rotated the main body of the craft about 35 degrees to put the solar panels at least out as far away from the shadow as they could 
and they're hoping come next summer when the comet gets closest into the sun that at least some period of time when it's close to the sun either the amount of sunlight or the reflected sunlight or whatever will actually work to their favor and maybe help the uh, landing craft actually come back to life again and return some more data and maybe accomplish a few more things but I still overall um, give this the, as far as the mission and accomplishing good science I give them a solid C I would call it a solid satisfactory because also I give the engineers credit that you could have two out of your three landing systems fail and still end up getting the thing to touch down on the comet's surface for the very first time and send back at least some useful data I mean you know very well they designed it good if they could have the harpoons fail they could have the retro jets that were keeping it from bouncing fail and still have it come down and produce data for two and a half days definitely solid C if not maybe a little bit more so Thank you again for everybody that are submitting all of your different articles. makes my show much easier to do when you guys participate like that, and I appreciate it very much. And take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.